Okay, so I'm going to introduce uh, Paul. It's an enormous pleasure to have him speak to us today. He's a very distinguished educator, scholar, and activist working at the intersection of animal studies, law, ethics, religion, and cultural studies. He is a, a professor at Canisius Cap College in Buffalo, New York. He is the incoming director of the Master of Science graduate program in anthrozoology, for which he has been the lead faculty member since the program's founding in 2011. He has also taught animal law at, Har at the Harvard Law School since 2002, and he teaches a summer term course there called Animals, Religion, and Ethics. He, he's the, the former director of the Center for Animals and Public Policy, and he taught veterinary ethics and public policy at Tufts University School of Veterinary Medicine for more than a decade. He has completed five books, the most recent of which are Animal Studies and Introduction and Animal Rights. He is the co-editor of uh, the very excellent book, uh, Communion, Communion of Subjects, Religion and An uh, Animals and Religion, uh, ethics, uh, science, and ethics, uh, which he which he co-edited with Kimberly Patton and an elephant in the room, the science and well-being of elephants in captivity. His first book was the specter of species speciesism, Buddhist and Christian views of animals, which examines which which, which examined prejudices against animals in early Buddhist and Christian texts. And today he's going to be talking to us about about us. Uh, about friction, creative tensions between the conservation and animal protection movements. Yeah, so it's a great pleasure to have you have you here, and I'm very excited. <laughs> well, here, let me do this, and if the sound quality dips, let me know, or if the vis visual dips. Um, from my discussions with Victoria, I have a sense that the group that I'm talking to here is um, uh, full of people who are deeply committed to active citizenship in a form that aspires to protect other animals, not just humans. And that to me is really a, a privilege to speak to such groups. I don't usually get that kind of group in education. Um, I'm much more in the... Uh, center of the world where we certainly have some activists, but we have other people who are very uh, committed to humans having total privileges. Um, although in the program I'm in, I get wonderfully sensitive people and we're able to cultivate even more sensibilities, and that's really quite good. I, I, uh, I'm not going to go on terribly long only because I know if I can, from past experience, if I can just be a bit provocative here uh, and be in dialogue with your activism side and my own, um, I'll develop a deeper understanding of some of the ways that I can be more effective in the world, which I think is incredibly important and it's mattered to me for a couple decades now, especially because the present environment is so dominated by human centeredness. Uh, maybe even a, a worse term than that, human, we're the animals that matter. In fact, we matter in such a way that we deny our animality. We talk about ourselves as humans and all the others are the animals. Um, that, that sort of human exceptionalism prevails in so many ways that it's debilitating and I'm going to talk a little bit about that. To spark conversation when I finish here, just to be provocative, um, I want to raise uh, some, a, a sort of subset of problems that come out of the relationship of animal protection and environmental concerns or eco ecological concerns or conservation. I'm going to raise this in two basic ways up front, but a few more ways as we go along. How can we use the notion of activism, active citizenship, to discuss freedom? I think that's critically important. I think activism, active citizenship, is a fundamental form of freedom that needs to be encouraged, and all of us know in lots of industrialized societies today it's not. It's uh, discouraged in dramatic ways, in some ways just more subtle ways. Um, that's one question. How do we use the notion of activism to help us discuss freedom? Secondly, um, I think there's a way in which activism on behalf of non-human animals can be what a recent philosopher, Frederick Gross, in a recent book called A Philosophy of Walking, called a suspensive freedom. Let me see if I can explain what that is. Uh, Gross wants to point us to a really basic freedom, a basic kind of freedom that frees us from Entanglements and entanglements in opportunities, which we also call freedom. Uh, for example, gives the example of uh, walking 
get you connected back to the natural world, walking in the natural world, and it's a suspensive freedom. It suspends some other things we call uh, freedoms, like the opportunity to be entangled in consumerism. Uh, and he sees those certain kinds of things we call freedom, like walking in the store and having 1,000 different kinds of cereal to choose from for your breakfast, most of which are nutritious, nutrition-wise terrible for you. Um, we would say, oh, we have freedom of choice, but the point is we're entangled ever deeper in a system when we buy, buy those kinds of products. And he's looking for a freedom that you go walking in the natural world away from the entanglements, and so you get a suspensive freedom through walking. And I think that's a really beautiful notion because not all freedoms are equal under this, obviously. And his kind of freedom, the suspensive freedom, helps us recover truly basic connections. That to me is really important. And I think activism is a kind of suspensive freedom. Uh, another one might be that our freedom to speak uh, is really important. You have it in Canada, we have it in the United States in limited forms. Uh, we're certainly freer than many other people in the world, but I hope we can use that freedom, the limited freedoms we have to speak, to strive for clarity in our language. That's what makes it a suspensive freedom, this freedom to speak, because you can move away from terribly, terribly misleading language choices like humans and animals. Humans are primates, humans are mammals, and these are categories of animal, of course, but we still slip away in the dualism, humans and animals, away from our own animality. And I think in talking about animal rights, there's a tremendous amount of freedom available there. And that's partly because, if you work it out this way, clearly, lots of animals have rights. Humans are animals, remember. But we sort of, we, we very much exclude these rights from the non-human animals. And in that way, I think we harm ourselves and entangle ourselves in a dualism we don't need. And so you can use animal rights language as a suspensive freedom to get us back to the connection of, listen, we belong in the world, uh, <laughs> we are in the world, we're never leaving it, and we're a wonderful example of what an animal, if we behave well, can be. Um, and I tried to write the 2011 book called Animal Rights for Oxford University Press just to talk about the different meanings of animal rights. It's very enabling meanings. There are some that are less enabling, but overall it seems to me quite a valuable concept. And that, I wanted to raise that simply because I'm quite interested in how we can work towards clarity in our language. Uh, how do we remove these artificial human-serving distinctions that gloss over our own animality? Uh, and being in tune with our language choices strikes me as uh, giving us another possibility. And that's when someone else speaks, being generous and fair-minded about their choices, how they're framing issues, and to work with them in a generous-hearted way. I try to do that with my students constantly without beating them up, without, but instead luring them into trying to use language in a more clarifying, less uh, separating sense. Here's a, another sense that it's animal activism is complicated in the animal protection sense. If you go into the political system, to try to make changes, you're going into the very system that's holding the oppressions in place. It's incredibly complicated. This is very clear if you're trying to do litigation, if you're trying to look at lawmaking, legislation, or if you're trying to do enforcement. All are fraught with terrible distortions and injustice. And these are in systems that work relatively well compared to many others, uh, where people have fewer freedoms than we have. Uh, so the legal system, if you want to use it, is fraught with peril. But it's very valuable in that it allows certain things to be done. Education systems are somewhat like this as well, but they're very limited. We, in our education systems in the United States, equip people to be more effective vandals of the world. Instead of teaching them to embrace the world, uh, we teach them in myriad ways to harm it. We dumb them down about the fact that they're mammals, primates, animals, and the connection to other animals is nearby, but we tend to deny it with our education. It's tragic. And we try to, I try to run a program here where people can be free to explore 
why would we do this to ourselves? Why would we do it to the other animals? And another option here is using environmental discourse, which each has very many problems with it, but also can be very enabling. Um, much of the environmental discourse that I've been around comes in forms that ignore the fundamental insights that animal protection gets to. The individuals matter. It isn't just species extinction that matters. It's harming individuals as well. And lots of environmental discourse has ignored that. Now, plenty of environmentalists also pay attention to it. And that was one of the points I was trying to make in the essay, Tyranny of Small Differences. Really, the differences are not so large. But they're, they're ramped up into huge differences, such that one of the examples I gave was conservationists in an American community lobbying against the establishment of an animal law course in the law school, when already 150 American law schools have these courses. So it's not a very radical change to offer that kind of course. So using political systems, legal systems, education systems, no easy chance. I mean, very fraught with problems because these are often the mainstays of oppression. And yet, look where we're at. We're at the University of Toronto, one of the really extraordinary educational institutions in the world with lots of possibilities, but you also know there are risks there. I go to Harvard pretty regularly, same thing. And lots of good things happening, but of course, it's hard to say on balance that good things are happening. Um, so in many ways, um, for me, the interesting thing is how do we work inside of systems that are the mainstays of oppression to undo those oppressions? I, I think teaching is a remarkable opportunity. Uh, and I know there are risks. For example, getting the job is hard. Further down the line is a heavy compromise, namely acting, behaving, so that you get tenure. Uh, so there's a potential for sellout there, and many people do, of course. Um, the system, your progress in the educational system towards tenure in the United States is controlled by others. It's been perilously difficult to be an animal protection person and to get into a position of influence. It, it happens for a few of us, but many people don't. So I do think amidst all of these challenges and risks, there are some positive signs. The Canisius program, we just recruited uh, a very deep applicant pool. We, interested, talented people who are going to do a lot of good. So our task is to get them to come here, educate them to be as powerful as they can be, and then pay forward all the advantages we've had and let them pay it forward out in the world. It's a very slow way to make social change, but it has a certain potential to it. Also, there's a lot of student demand. In America, colleges are hurting terribly, and this is a financially successful graduate program. Uh, so it has a certain, my goal is to lure many other colleges into cloning this one and creating these kinds of programs so far more than 20 people per year get this. I, one of the reasons I want to do that is so that humans can uh, take our natural place in the, what Leo, Aldo Leopold, the environmentalist, called the land community. He suggested we're not conquerors, we should be plain citizen and responsible member. And I think that's something humans can do and live in a much larger than, a more than human environment. And notice that that's an, an eminently environmental observation. Uh, Aldo Leopold was no animal protectionist, but he had insights which, if used creatively, really, really can help us see that environmental observations, if framed in a careful, caring way, dovetail nicely with animal protection sentiments. So. I actually see, well, let me take a, a pretty establishment circle that's about to publish something in an environmental sense that could electrify the world. That's Pope Francis uh, of the Catholic tradition about to do an encyclical on climate change. And he's going to speak to 1.2 billion Catholics around the world, many of whom are in denial of this problem, particularly in my country. Um, so I recognize that if Francis can get there, uh, if he can get his tradition to walk with animal protectionists, and I think this is a way that he can do that, there's a kind of win-win situation to this. Uh, each side, the Catholic Church will get its positions validated. Um, he's a very creative pope relative to the, his predecessors. But also animal protection can get validated as well here. 
and so can our deepest environmental insights. So um, I, that's, I just use that to try to suggest to you that there are possible synergies. I don't want to be too naive about this. There are terribly complex problems. Your government rivals mine in terms of uh, resource extraction uh, and harming, and we may have a bad election here and get the Keystone Pipeline passed. Obama just vetoed it. These are terribly important things for the future. I have no idea how they're going to go, but at the very, my hope is that if we can maximize our educational opportunities and increase environmental awareness, we can even create political opportunities and hopefully some change in the political discourse and educational discourse that's so human-centered right now. I know these comments are somewhat overly generalized. When I was preparing them, I thought, yeah, we'll come back in the questions to more specific things that need to be done, because there are a lot. And But I think sometimes if we can be careful with theoretical calculations, we can see that if they're well-framed, they can help us see further, especially if, we, if they get us more quickly back to practical work. So just briefly, to describe the origin of that article to you, Mark Beckhoff's a friend, we were talking. He said, hey, you want to write an article for this book? It's called Ignoring Nature. I said, sure, let me write about animal protection in the environmental group. Mark said, great, let's do it. So I wrote the article. When it was submitted, there was a reviewer for the manuscript who said, this is way too animal protection oriented. But in doing that, they, the article ultimately passed and was published. But the environmental persons um, revealed that environmental people can be so intolerant of any animal protection sentiments because in the article, it's very clear, I say, animal protection people commit the same kind of error I'm pointing out that conservation people committed. And that is a tyranny of small differences. These are cousins that should be working together. And instead, what happens is somebody tries to actually cut out animal protection from being included. So Mark and I laughed and just said, here's a good example of how much work we have to do. So my hope is that we can um, use groups like yours, clone them, get every, every university, every educational institution to have an, academy, an animal rights academy. Uh, they're very common here in the United States at certain levels, but frowned upon in others. So uh, for me, I'll, I'll stop there. What I'm interested in is see if I can't engage some of you, find out what kind of work you're doing, and see if, you, if there's a way that, uh, I mean, I find that kind of, discourse incredibly enabling for me to get a sense of what's happening around the world because lots of good things are, even if it's in the midst of a pretty challenging situation in both of our countries right now. It's all yours, Victoria. Uh, okay. Does anyone have any questions they'd like to put forward? Okay, I, I suppose I can start then. Uh, well, one, one thing I would like to ask you is you mentioned you, you, you mentioned uh, Pope Francis encyclical on climate change, and I was yeah, and I, I wanted to ask you about like seeing as this is becoming su such an, an enormous issue, it's going to be the the biggest issue over the next century, and I, I wanted to ask you about uh, what barriers we have to cross in mobilizing religious religious groups to to uh, become concerned about climate change and the, the role that animal protection will play in, in mitigating climate change, like as we see with the, the, the animal agriculture industrial complex, for example. Yeah, Victoria, that's, well, there's about four or five, there's so many issues here, and I'm not, I, others in the room are gonna have ideas here, I think, quite relevant to how religious institutions can help. They obviously are hurting in certain ways. Um, often in my country, religious communities are great supporters of factory farming. Um, there is this, some of you will know that there's a very large group at Yale called the Forum on Religion and Ecology, which has for about a quarter of a century been working, I've been working with them to try to get religious communities more tuned up. And, and we're very far along right now. 
compared to where we were. The Forum on Religion and Ecology just sent out a list of all the, not all, but many articles from world media about the upcoming encyclical. And I was stunned to see how many there were and how really high profile these were. And uh, I think the key, Victoria, is probably the voice has to come from within the religious communities. Mm -hmm. There's a saying, it's very hard to get a per to argue a person out of a situation when he or she has not argued themselves into it. And I think some of the resistance here is not a matter of argument that we might, in a sort of critical thinking way, advance, trying to marshal evidence and draw conclusions. Instead, there are religious communities who have their own discourse, and you need to go into those communities and use that discourse and their deep ethical commitments and see if you can't parlay good people skills with pulling them into awareness that this is a terribly important issue for both humans and the more than human community as well. But that's really easy to say in a generalized way. Now the practical realities here are um, getting less consumption, getting more green power, that's a pretty complicated strategy, but still it's, it's an important one. I mean, our political discourse, I'm not sure which country right now has more difficult political discourse, yours or mine, <laughs> um, because we have governments, we have a fairly friendly government in a relative sense right now in the Obama administration, but we have a Republican majority in both of our houses, extraordinarily reactionary as you know, oh, yes. and I mean, this isn't the only problem my country faces with its 1,000 plus military installations outside our own country. So what do, what do I do as an American? I try to teach and pay it forward, I try to get as involved as I can, um, I try to stay hopeful. I have a very, very good personal relationship because that's what I need to sustain myself given the lack of hope sometimes when you read the New York Times headlines. But overall, my sense, I'd be curious if people in the room are optimistic or if you see, oh, there are darker days coming still. I'm just curious, are others comfortable saying, I'm somewhat optimistic, and I think diet changes are coming, and et cetera. I'm just curious if others feel optimism or if you're straddling despair right now. Yeah. Well, uh, I, I would like to be optimistic, but I, but one of the things that, that really concerns me that I see as a big hurdle to being optimistic is just how committed, uh, how, how committed the entities responsible for this catastrophe are to, uh, squeezing out that last drop of oil to exploiting animals and instrumentalizing animals to, uh, the furthest degree they can. Like, it is, it, capitalism can be, I, I think capitalism can be seen as religious in, in a way, like, in that it does not want to, there, there's, in the minds of, uh, the most committed capitalists, there's no way of compromising, uh, in, in his essay, The Religion of the Market, Dave, David Loy argues that capitalism is, a, is a form of religion and it's a syncretic religion and the most powerful one we've seen so far, so, yeah, I would like to be optimistic, and like I think there is a lot of potential for change. But I think, uh, I think one way in which uh, like we failed a lot, and I, I mean, I think on the left, like I, I think on the left, like we're partly responsible for this uh, uh, as well as that. There seems to be a lack of imagination and there a lack of creativity in imagining alternatives to capitalism. Yes, I, I agree. I'm curious if others have that any sense of hope because it seems to me hope hope can be a very it can be a very misleading thing of course but it can also be an enabling thing I'm curious if others are comfortable saying yes I'm relatively optimistic or or I'm buckling up for more despair yeah I, I have moments where I maybe I need to you, you should, you should yeah. walk up to the microphone yeah thank you thank the you microphone. Hi. Um, I have moments where I'm optimistic when I see companies like Beyond Meat, um, Beyond Meat coming out. Uh, I see companies coming out with extra products, extra vegan products. I see uh, mainstream p 
people like Chipotle opening up their product line to include vegan items. But at the same time, um, I see fractures in the movement when people are upset at World Wildlife Fund, the big environmental organization, um, promoting hunting. And companies in the, in the developing countries, well, not developing, but China and India using more meat. So I think it's, it's sort of a big, uh, a swing. You know, sometimes you see positive news and sometimes it's quite depressing. Yeah, the media can play such an important role of giving us opportunities to see some of the good things happening. But in, in my country, media tends to be very interested in scandal, corruption, um, uh, lots of naked sex and violence. And you think, gosh, great. Because uh, the, the good news doesn't fit into those categories particularly well. But, but we're, we're, there is a major player here. The Huffington Post made a commitment to try to be more um, fair-handed in, in handing out good news as well as all the, the chaotic stuff we usually see. I also think it's wonderful that you mentioned the product lines. Uh, there are, since in the 70s, there were theologians who uh, pressed the case uh, against what was called economism, and which is very much what the Tory mentioned. And I happen to have, and I'll, I'll show you here this book. Some of you will have seen this book. I think it comes up. This is uh, oh, yes. Naomi Klein's This Changes Everything. And here is the, the subtitle is Capitalism Versus the Climate. This is a 600-page book, incredibly well-argued. She's very, very articulate, getting lots of high profile, but it's a book. It's a book. And the point is we need lifestyles. And we need <laughs> political leaders. But not, but this is, we may be at the stage where writing books is something we have to do in order to develop the awareness that's the, the tipping point. It's, uh, I don't see it happening tomorrow. Um, so I'm kind of curious if others, thank you for sharing that. That's really helpful for me to hear that. <clears throat> Hi, my name is Carlos and uh, some of the group here, hello, <laughs> uh, have created a, a project. It's called the Climate Vegan. And uh, we are trying to, to link animal agriculture with, uh, with the climate change. And there's gonna be a few opportunities uh, right now here in Ontario, our province, where there's going to be uh, round tables with politicians, local politicians discussing the climate change. Uh, the Ontario government is actually asking for, it's going to hold, hold, hold lots of meetings and they are going to ask for opinions on, on, from people uh, and submit questions and uh, write to them about what they think should be included in the climate change. They obviously offer guidelines in the website that does not mention at all uh, uh, animal agriculture. You just go for change your bulbs and, and uh, reduce electricity consumption, things like that. But we, I think we ought to create some noise and, and bring the issue of animal agriculture uh, to the table because it's one of the major causes of climate change, as we all know, and it is hardly on the radar. So the idea is to make some noise and, and go to these meetings and write to them and let's say, you have gotta include this too. Let's, let's see what, what veganism, vegetarianism can do for the climate change. And I think they should be just more important than anything you, you might be suggesting. Yeah, thank you. That's, the vegan diet is such an important thing. Of course, it can be complicated. In my country, if I want to eat vegan, I can eat products that are pretty impressive. They've been trucked across the country. Um, it's very hard to know the source of things. Uh, that's very, very rich. I, I, I work with my students on this saying, listen, it's all of us are in pretty complicated places, but if we can just get the habit of mind of seeing what's the source of what you're eating? What went into it? Um, it's possible, for example, for me to eat a soy product that is the product of monoculture where the, the deer that came down to the field might have been shot and, uh, and yet the product is seemingly vegan. It's like, well, all right, how am I supposed to know this? This is pretty complicated stuff. But the point is the delivery lines of products are so removed and complicated that, that um, it's a challenge for us, but I, I really think that that kind of thing, the local climate vegan uh, 
project you mentioned, my students have these sorts of things here as well. Uh, that's, we just have to work at the local level constantly, 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 and in a, a way that gives us more effectiveness. Is that to misbehave? Is that to be polite? It probably depends on context. So, I've, uh, to me, activism is, it's not as if the Republican uh, conservative majority isn't hyperactive on behalf of a cause. It's just that when we disagree with them, we're called activists, sometimes terrorists. <laughs> and um, it seems to me that the terrorist shoe was on actually their feet, not ours. So. Yeah. So. <laughs> I think it's, a, it's such a pleasure for me to talk with activists because I, I'm actually very well behaved in life. I, have, I exist in a big, you know, Catholic university and um, I have a few I can misbehave with here, but only a few of the Jesuits. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a question of there's a job to be done. I'm not here to be, I'm not here for those other purposes. And it's fun to be kind of, what's the word? Constructively misbehaving <laughs> in a polite, charming way that makes them, hopefully pulls them further. That's an <laughs> endlessly difficult challenge to know where to draw the line. Where to draw the line. So. Sure, sure. Um, talking of activism, one of, this is Jenny again, uh, one of the things that I've been involved with is um, Direct Action Everywhere, where Direct Action Everywhere, where we go into, say, a Whole Foods um, incognito, and then all of a sudden we unfurl all our banners and start shouting that, you know, it's um, murder, um, not meat, it's murder. That's one of the actions that's happening um, across North America now, which is uh, quite exciting. Yeah, thank you. That's, and I've, over the last 20 years, I've, I've probably seen about four or five different times where people go into that fairly direct sort of thing. Um, it's a, such an interesting thing for me. Uh, I, tomorrow, I, will, I do a, a presentation with the chaplain, the spirituality director at the school and I, and it's on... Um, inclusive spirituality. Well, for whatever reason, the chaplain has picked up the animal co animal protection cause here. It's as if he's had a conversion. No pun intended. Um, Excellent. Oh, it's just amazing. And so we'll stand up. The sponsors of this are my program, the chapel, the chapel group, the, the, the campus ministry, and the Dean of Students are the sponsors of this. So we'll have a, we'll have vegan fair, um, and, and there'll be about 40 people there, and we'll talk about how being inclusive includes non-human animals, but also humans as well, why there is a sort of humility that goes with this. And I'll quote the very, very wonderful theologian, if you don't know him, he's worth reading amazingly, interesting man named Dietrich Bonhoeffer, oh, yes. um, killed by the Nazis, was a participant in the murder Hitler plot, boy that's <laughs> complicated for an ethicist, but he, he thought, I'll take the punishment, I'll stand up and take it, this guy's got to be gotten rid of. And uh, it, Dietrich Bonhoeffer is no one's fool. Another one is the, the great the Catholic mystic Thomas Merton, who, has, who was a peace advocate, very effective. It was a time of uh, nuclear weapons, and he was as as outspoken on that as almost anyone. Very, very effective. And so the point here is that, it, you know, there are plenty of people in the establishment who have goodwill. The question is luring them into the animal protection issue as well as the justice issue for so many humans who are deprived of it. So we, it's a really interesting balance here. We seem to be doing it well, and I'm pleased. It's only going to be 40 people there. I'd much rather have, you know, add a few zeros to that, but that's not, that's what's available in this world. And I think of it, Victoria, when you say, you, Victoria and I, have, and I have had some conversations about going down and do presentations. These are the kinds of things that are, that are like planting seeds of redwood trees in order to um, sit under the shade eventually. <laughs> it will take a while. Um, but what other, what other choices do we have in the present system other than to work the system in a fair, constructive way 
Um, it's very humbling, though, to be this, to be going this slowly. It's really humbling. <laughs> so, so. I'd like to take up uh, what what you said about this being a, a process of humbling, because often. An, an idea that's rolled around in my head is that uh, what we're seeing with uh, with climate change and like as as like the Catholic mystic Thomas Berry would say, uh, expanding expanding our, our sphere of ethical consideration, like to include a, a biocentric community rather than an anthropocentric one. And I, I and I think that that what we're doing really is like just embracing a kind of humility. It's I mean, to use Freud's language, it's a it's a blow to human narcissism. It's a it's a blow to our arrogance. Uh, we're we're realizing that it's it's another way of us realizing that we're not particularly special. Like that maybe maybe other creatures could be made in God's image as well, if you want to put it in theological terms. Yes, that's a lovely thought, Victoria. Just so you'll get a sense of how the, I think the humility point. It's the point I make in the 2013 book, Animal Studies, that. It's just an absolute essential for going forward, especially because we've all been uh, educated in uh, educational institutions that have filled us with the idea that human intelligence is paradigmatic for all intelligence. Yes. And I don't think careful intelligence really justifies that. Um, there is a wonderful 18th century figure, uh, Helvetius, who said, Humans are not uh, born uh, stupid, they're born ignorant, they're made stupid by education. Now, that's a very complex strategy for someone who's a teacher like I am. But I, I will go back to the Canisius program for a second. This system has yielded because so many people are interested in non-human animal issues. They are. Uh, they didn't hire me because they're so moral and they find me so articulate. They hired me because um, they sensed, here's a chance to have a successful graduate program, and success is measured here by students coming and paying tuition. It's not measured by moral means, measured by financial means. Unfortunately. But part of me thinks, well, OK, OK, this is the world. How I know that the demographics are there. I pitched them on this. It's worked out wonderfully. Um, it's pleasurable. It doesn't get any more pleasurable in education than this. Um, and I, I'm aware that if we conduct ourselves well, other people will say, can I use an American commercial image? We want a piece of that action. Um, they will want to have these kind of programs because they have declining enrollment. And I think at the same time we're meeting many people's desire to come and carefully engage our own animality, our membership in these, this larger community. That's a Thomas Berry term. Uh, and Victoria, thank you for mentioning him. He, Barry is, I, I'm very fortunate to be an integral part of the Thomas Barry group in the United States, and um, that's the group head, headquartered at Yale, and uh, they're the ones who enabled my religion and animals work. They were environmentalists, and when I mentioned to Mary Evelyn Tucker, she was doing some ecology conferences, religion and ecology conferences, I said, you should do an animal conference. In a millisecond, she turned and said, that's a great idea, you organize it, I'll get you the funds. But here's a person of vision, and she is uh, uh, an unequaled leader, uh, maybe an equal by a few people, but unbelievable woman. Uh, just a leader of the first rank, and softly and effic efficiently. And she has pushed, has helped, along with John, her husband, has pushed, and about 2,000 scholars around the world that uh, take their cue from her. Um, has really helped this religion and ecology thing, and it, it is so much more advanced than you might suspect. But the question is, how do we build it, build it, build it? Mm -hmm. And that's why I mentioned the, the uh, Francis. Remember, I'm at a Jesuit school. Francis is the first Jesuit pope ever. Okay. They're excited here. And so <laughs> I'm using my lawyer skills to say, hey, you know he's going to do something on climate. And they're all, oh. Oh, that must be important then. And so, slowly but surely, this school's getting a little more sensitive to that. But I, I still think the issue is all of us standing out and 
trying to pay it as far forward as we can. And it's a, a Victor, Victoria, that's one of the reasons when you called, I thought, yeah, I'll do this, I'll do this. Speaking to small groups is, is energizing and important, even if it is time consuming after a, a long and tiring day. It's just an important thing to do. Um, but it's also energizing on my side. Yeah, yeah, thank you so much for your enthusiasm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, does anybody else have questions? I, to me, I come from a large Catholic family. I haven't practiced Catholicism in 47 years, <laughs> so I'm a little overdue for confession. Um, but, uh, but I'm used to very large groups and curious, and in my family there are a lot of wonderfully interesting and dysfunctional people, so our gatherings are unbelievably interesting and very loving. So for me, I always like when there's a lot of different people that I get vantage points because I'm used to really, really wide-ranging views in my own family. Yes, yes, I, I was also thinking that would be a good question as well. Um, I wonder, um, we had um, a session last, we had a session last week where we were talking on controversial topics. Um, personally, I like Peter, the um, Ingrid Newkirk's organization, but so many people are against what she does. I just wondered what your viewpoint is on that. Uh, I've met Ingrid a couple different times and been in the room. First of all, never seen anybody be that good a fundraiser. You know, she, PETA's budget, I think, is over 30 million per year, and she's pretty much the fundraiser. She's phenomenal. Um, as a person, she's very, very skilled with people, and you can, I once did a television interview, and she was before me. So I'm in the studio, I'm not on yet, and she's having a very heavy debate. It's on like Hannah T and Combs, one of the really reactionary shows here. But she loves that stuff. So she and the, her opponent are going at it, hammer and tongs, unbelievably bitter stuff when they're on the air. As soon as they go off to a commercial break, they break, you can see her drop, smile, say, how are you? How are your, how are your children? Da, 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 da. Wonderful people skills. And then as soon as the camera's back on, they were back like cat and dogs. It was something to see. So what, I think she's a force. Um, I've been in many circles which it, it's, it was a complete political impossibility to bring her because people see her as uh, so far gone that she breaks the conversation that's possible in some environments. The one I'm in is like this. And it's a... Uh, I don't know. Um, I'm sad for that, but it's also it's it's a question of what's possible. There's so many great people to bring in. Um, for example, I'm pushing to get the head of the International um, Institute of Humane Education here because that's a person who goes into school for schools that educate small children in humane education. And here, humane education is a term that means protecting non-human animals and environmental sensibilities as well. And I think in many ways that's a key thing to do. This is uh, Zoe Weil, some of you may know her, W-E-I-L, fantastically productive person, and I want her to have more exposure. And I think that's the kind of person that when, in my program, there'll be 20 people come, there's always 18 or 19 women out of 20. So Zoe is uh, like a model. You put her up in front, she's vibrant, imaginative, intelligent, just basically very good. And I, my sense is that the people in the audience think, I, I, I could do something like that. Think, this is part of what it is to be a primate. Imitate, follow, model. And Ingrid is a much more hard sell on the imitation. She, she's totally, not that so isn't one of a kind, but Ingrid Newkirk is an unbelievably unique individual. I suppose all of us are. But if that's true, more true of someone than others, it's more true of her. And so I wish her well. I wish her totally well. But I know there are some, she's radioactive in certain circumstances. And it's a question of, all right, then let's play that for what it is. She was just at Harvard 
She's actually Thursday of this week, she'll be at Harvard, uh, invited to come to Harvard. And that's a place which is really powerful and, and handles, is very welcoming to her. So for me, those are the kind of places you can get her at. This is the law school. Very, very uh, healthy, open uh, environment for freedom of speech. Uh, and she's unbelievably effective. Another one person who's a bit like that, you guys may know the name of the feminist, uh, eco-feminist Carol Adams. Oh, yes. Carol's a really wonderful long-term friend and soft and beautiful up close. And yet, uh, when she's up, up at the podium, she can be real strident. But I know her very well. And, and she's just a completely, in fact, I just realized I got an email from the other day because she's coming up. She's from Buffalo. And the question is, I'm making a note to myself to make sure that I reply to her, Carol. Um, so there's another person who has an interesting persona in public, but in person is different. So it's a question of how do we use these speakers in each venue where they succeed and, and get, if you're in one that where she's not going to succeed, get somebody else who will. This is to me a real important strategy. But I think it, to answer the question as directly as I can, I'm quite thankful for Ingrid Newkirk. She's made huge strides in the animal protection movement. Huge. But she's not winning any popularity contests. And you think, well, maybe that's a strategy I should employ. <laughs> Yay. Hi, uh, my name's uh, Colleen. Um, I'm a, and I'm sorry, your name is what? Colleen. Hi. Um, I'm, a, I'm a master's student at York University. Um, where is the next one? Oh, I'm back. Right here. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm studying environmental studies. Um, when I first started the program, I kind of thought, like... Hmm? Yep, I can see you now. Okay. <laughs> Um, when I when I started the program, I kind of thought like, okay, good, you know, I'm finally I'm with my people, I'm I'm gonna have a lot in common with everybody, and for the most part, I do. But then when the topic of animal rights comes up, um, people kind of get really defensive, and uh, it's it's really strange that we can be so passionate about the same things and then just have this wall comes up when we talk about animals. Um, and I, I'm wondering um, about the conservation movement. I mean, I know particularly in Canada, uh, well, and the and the United States, you know, like Ducks Unlimited and that kind of conservation um, organizations. It was more to conserve animals for hunting. Um, but I think you know we have moved on from that quite a bit. But there's still that attitude of um, human domination over over the environment so we're we're still passionate about protecting it but it's for us instead of for uh, its own intrinsic worth um, I was wondering if you see any progress on that front I guess. So, I, that's a beautiful question and in many ways that's very nicely framed um, yes I do see progress on it I think it's the job of animal protection to make environmentalism more realistic. If I was to do a logical analysis and say, which of these is the larger concept? The environmental slash conservation slash ecology approach or animal protection, I'd say, well, clearly the environmental conservation one is the genus and animal protection is the species in that genus. And in that sense, the environmental is larger. For example, it, I think if someone's an animal protectionist, she has to, let's say I want to protect orcas. I, I can't possibly protect orcas unless I know about their environment. I just can't. There's no way you can know how an orca is thriving, what's its social life like in, in the context of its incredible brain and intelligence um, and family connection. If you don't know and protect its larger ecosystem. This is just crucial. And so I think, okay, all right, if you wanted to be, if someone said to me, I'm an animal protectionist, I want to protect the most animals possible, how would I do that? I'd say, go be an environmentalist. Be an effective environmentalist. You'll save far more animals. That's how it works. You're, because you're going to protect entire habitats where there are just literally billions of living beings. And 
I don't mean to be facile with that comment because I think, as I mentioned in that essay, animal protection is closer to the vest, as it were. It is much more in contact with a skill that each of us has as we sit in this conversation, we brought into the room with us, and that's the ability to care about specific others. Animal protection is playing this out in, this is the basic insight, and and if you extrapolate that, you get really good environmental work. Um, environmentalists miss this, and there are stories in some of the books I've done about an MIT guy who used to teach, was an adjunct of the Tufts program I ran, and he said, I don't know why it is, Paul, but um, your, your students are so much more attentive and involved than mine. He had an MIT environmental studies students, superstars in the academic world. But he said they were somewhat generalized and like removed from their subject matter. They cared immensely to do this. But the animal protection people not only cared immensely to do it, they had dogs and cats that they had interpersonal interactions with and were guided by and um, constantly, um, I don't know, energized by, I think is probably the right word. And we, we talked about that and it really was that close to our daily lives, the chance to interact with other individuals and protect them is an, an instance of, I quote uh, Viktor Frankl in several of my books where he says, listen, the only way to, there's only one way to real self-actualization and that's self-transcendence. If you want to become all that you are, you have to self-transcend and the way that you do that is by caring about others. Environmentalists don't always know that. Sometimes it's like, I'm saving the environment for my children and for myself. Think, oh, yuck, 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 yuck. Okay, please save it. Please be very effective. Um, but for me, animal protection and environmental, is, they're so cousins. and They're like a hand in a glove. And I, the very best ones I know on both sides do both of them flawlessly well. And in that sense, I am encouraged. Um, but the overall environmental movement has been co-opted by a lot of greenwashing, as it were. So that's something that happens to every social movement, sadly. And this one's no different. But I don't, I, I'm, I'm encouraged. I constantly integrate environmental messages into my, every one of my classes has large environmental content, even though it's an animal-focused program, because I want a holistic approach to these living beings and, and the community that we share. So, so I'm encouraged. I'm encouraged. Um, I was just wondering if you have any advice, like any any um, anything that you found that works to say to uh, the non-animal protectionist environmentalists to kind of get them to understand your perspective. Um, yeah, there. Uh, that's another marvelous question. I think the first answer is, well, here, let me tell you a story about evangelicals. 2011, I go down to the Humane Society of the United States. They have about 40 people in. 30 of them are southern evangelicals in the United States. And if you know what that means, it means they're religiously hyper-conservative. So when I'm, we're going around introducing them, teaching at Harvard at the time, I'm very proud to tell them I'm teaching at Harvard. I realized later that to tell Southern evangelicals who teach at Harvard is like saying, I'm the representative from hell. <laughs> they don't, they hate Harvard. Um, but I got to know them and I, I talked with them. I said to one of them, what would it take uh, to be in dialogue with you and your community? His response was, come and live with us for a year and say nothing. Show us that you respect our way of living. Now, that's relevant to what's effective. It's listening to an environmentalist and telling her or him, I see the point you're making. Let me see if I can't give you a point that, um, uh, what's the word, perhaps uh, celebrates what you're saying and maybe takes it in my world in a, a direction that, that also applies and, and then give them an animal protection story, but dovetail with their work as opposed to overriding them. I mean, this is tough when environmentalists become bullies, and they do that. Like where they oppose that establishment of an animal law class. It just was bullying. Um, and so the question is, of course they're there, but those people need to be walked with. Um, 
And let me give you another example to show you how the animal protection side, I think, has a trump of the same kind. Someone said to me, oh, I don't know if orcas are that smart. I said, well, I'll tell you what, do this. Come with me, and for six months, every day, let's go up to, off of Vancouver Island is the... Or, and I said, kayak with me every day. For six months, we'll go around the orcas. Not right around them, because they're so fast they can get away, but eventually you'll be around them. But when we come back to camp, after 12 hours of being in the kayak, don't say anything. Just enjoy it. We'll eat, get up the next day, do the same thing. Six months. After six months, I'll ask you a question. You think orcas are, are morally significant? That person would say, oh, hell yes. Oh my God, yes, because they would be familiar with them, not in terms of words and ideas, but in actual experience and in a way that didn't harm the orcas and was in the orcas environment and the orcas are very respectful of humans and they, they can handle our presence there if you're not, I mean, they can, they're just, they can get away. So the point I'm making is that with uh, people that you want to convince, sometimes you have to walk with them a terribly long time and give them a chance on their own in good faith to come across the insights that you know are there, but if you pointed it out to them, they're just going to turn and look the other way. So what's the way to do this? That's a little bit like planting those redwood seeds to sit in shade, I know, but I do think that's really what it takes. In a social movement, you need a certain level of people skills to show the other people that you are willing to listen, and maybe that translates to them being willing to listen to you. That's a pretty complicated strategy, but I don't see when you're in a situation where non-human animals are getting so harmed, I don't see any other strategy than to say, we're trying to find strategies to get you people to listen, because that's obviously the problem, is that you're not taking seriously the stuff we're talking about. How do you do that? So, not, no simple strategy, is it? No. I didn't go live in that, I did not go live in the evangelical community for a year. No. <laughs> no. Um, so needless to say, they've never invited me. <laughs> I'm curious if any of you have seen, have strategies that you, if, I, if you don't mind me flattering you, I don't know if you're all Canadians, but Canadians are so much more urbane for, friends in Canada, when I go visit them, I'm always like, wow, this is really pleasant. You guys are, uh, there's much less, I mean, you know, first of all, I don't, I'm not including the Toronto mayor. I don't know if he's still mayor. <laughs> um, uh, but, <laughs> yeah, he must be an American export. Um, in any event, um, but I find Canadians to be, have a cosmopolitanness and gentleness that has always been extremely easy for me to deal with. But that's perhaps because I haven't traveled enough in your country and I've traveled too much in mine. So, so I'm curious if you, I think of Canadians as perhaps being able to solve problems that Americans may not see, um, or at least admit to seeing. So I'm wondering if any of you have experiences that you're willing to share about what works, because I could use some advice as well. Hi, my name is Paul. Hi, Paul. Hi. Um, I actually am employed, uh, I'm actually employed by the Catholic Church. You were talking earlier about uh, movements within the church to start to acknowledge uh, the situation of, of animals, especially animals that are, are eaten uh, and worn. Uh, I've, uh, I work at a church and I've circulated pamphlets from the Christian Vegetarian Association and from Father John Deere, a Jesuit, who, who's written on the subject. Uh, and I've engaged priests and, and other people uh, to, with varying degrees of success. I don't think I've really made any strong headway. However, uh, I do occasionally get positive feedback from individual parishioners and people who tell me that they've they've made changes and they've really been inspired to think about their habits. Uh, and I, I decided in, uh, when I was muddling along uh, in my approach to, um, for instance, eating with with the clergy, uh, I, I used to I used to just decline the the meat 
and and sit at the table. And, and then I decided I can't do that anymore. I'm very uncomfortable with that. And I stopped doing it. And I explained that that my my vegan uh, commitment I is such that I, I don't want to participate in meat meals anymore. And to my surprise, um, the clergy said, oh, well, we'll make sure that there is vegan food uh, that will be served uh, for everybody. And I was thrilled at that, because that, to me, that was a generous move. And uh, it's, it pointed towards possible progress. Uh, However, I mean, it's baby steps, as, as you know, and, and you have to be very diplomatic about these things and try not to uh, offend people, which is <laughs> uh, maybe easier with strangers than with, with, with family. Uh, I don't know. And I wanted to mention one other thing, or ask you about one other thing, and that's the, the intersection of, of uh, sustainability movements such as, for instance, the Zeitgeist movement, which is a kind of has aspirations to be a global movement uh, and has quite a vegan presence. Uh, However, the, the, the core of this group, which claims to be leaderless and non-hierarchical, somehow on, on Facebook managed to suppress a, a Valentine's Day plot of its vegan, um, vegan uh, what would you call it, caucus, to, to flood the, the pages with pro-vegan messages uh, with a kind of a response that, that claimed that these messages were too aggressive and that they were alienating people within the movement. Uh, and it was kind of a, it came across to me as a kind of paternalistic response to its own membership. Uh, and, and I think it backfired because the, the, the comments that were received in the hundreds were overwhelmingly pro-vegan and showed that in fact there needs to be more uh, acknowledgement uh, that veganism and sustainability and social movements uh, need to communicate more with each other. And uh, there needs to be more space for vegan subjects in uh, in these movements. And I'm, I'm just wondering if you have any experience with with uh, alternatives to capitalism in in social movements. Gosh, that would be. I wish you know, Paul. To me, that's one of the critical things. I, I've become increasingly shrill about capitalism and corporations and their excessive privileges. Well. Um, th let me go back to the uh, Jesuits and the vegan option. I really think that's which is fundamental work. Being out of the world and building in that way, it's hard to know how much you build with it, but it is it is wonderful that you engage. When I was at Oxford, uh, I was quite close friends with Andrew Lindsay, who's the animal theology uh, theologian at Oxford, and Andrew would invite me to his college, and we'd sit at what's called high table with the faculty. And so Andrew, Andrew is, is an aggressive vegan, and so we have, without ever asking me, he would order a vegan meal for me. He insisted his guests always have vegan meals, which was fine for me, it was good for me. But um, so a vegan meal is brought to me, and I'm sitting to my right as a philosopher. Uh, He's a philosopher at Oxford, so he's obviously a pretty interesting, accomplished person. And he says to me, he's got meat, and he says to me, do you mind if I eat meat? And I turned to him and said, it's your meal. And then he said, no, but do you mind if I eat meat? I said, it's really your choice. My choice is here. That's your choice. And the third time he said, but do you mind? I said, okay, if you're going to ask three times, I'll answer you honestly. Yes, of course I mind. But I actually think it's your choice, and I would more mind me forcing you not to eat your choice. I want you to choose. You choose. I would prefer you chose vegan if you knew what was behind this. And and I thought, what a strange thing for a philosopher to not recognize that I'm trying to be saying, just go for it. It did. I wasn't offended in the sense that I, I'm going to get up and leave the table. But if he if he asked me, I thought it's just such an unconscious move. To, to eat in that way and to go after the vegetarian. Besides being, I was a guest, how ungracious is that? <laughs> so for me, part of it is, and Paul, you did a nice job, I think the example you gave is you almost have to model this stuff. Um, veganism is such a beautiful thing and, and it's going so slowly, <laughs> so, so slowly. So, and in the in the in um, organizations misbehaving, um, I've been quite interested in in the work of Friedrich Nietzsche re recently. And Nietzsche once said, 
Nietzsche was a unbelievably insightful guy who at the end of his life goes insane and he's, but he's, my mentor, the, the philosopher of religion, John Hick, when he was young, read him voraciously, like someone might read Harry Potter. I mean, he just totally read everything. And, and I, did, I never, so I, I picked these things up and thought, oh, no, what, it's really fascinating work. But Nietzsche once said, listen, insanity in individuals is rare enough, but in organizations, institutions, and groups, it's the rule. <laughs> thought, yeah, yeah, groups. Our social psychology can be even more uh, aberrant in behavior, in behavior than our individual dysfunctions. So, I'm never very surprised when groups misbehave. I, what is it about us in groups that where we go crazy insane? <laughs> Not that individuals are all that delightful in my country. <laughs> so, um, I'm not sure of the answer to, to, I mean, when groups claim to be non-hierarchical, hierarchical, I really value it and I realize not going very far, is it? <laughs> um, and I wish it would. Um, I wish it would, but it's very complicated in the present environment to have, the bigger you get, somehow the dirtier you get, it seems, in this country. I wish somebody would have a story that said, Paul, that's not true. <laughs> it's an excessive generalization. That's how I, I, I play devil's advocate with my students and will say, that gen it's too much of a generalization. Bring it back down to reality. Just say it happens most of the time, not it happens all the time. So. <laughs> Yeah, yeah.